I uh, request all the speakers, uh, Dr. Widerman, Peter, can, uh, you can come here and uh, join along with me on the desk so that uh, we can have a more uh, stage presence uh, before calling you on to, uh, to speak. Dr. Gyan Prakash, yeah, oh, please sit anywhere. It is all seats are ours. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gerald Schultz. And Dr. Bruce Fivey, please come on to the uh, dais and occupy the seats here so that um, the, we can have a, a good interactive session. Uh, this is a very prestigious session of uh, presidential guest lectures. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Uh, Natarajan uh, to come and share the dais. So um, we uh, got delayed uh, a bit uh, by 10 minutes because there was interesting discussion was going on and we don't want to interrupt uh, that. However, um, we start this uh, and try to end the session on time. Uh, we have uh, significant international luminaries it is very fortunate to have them uh, in one session and uh, they are going to share their uh, experiences. In this, uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, uh, President's guest speaker, Dr. Peter Weiderman. He is the President of uh, Council of In uh, uh, International Council of Ophthalmology. And yesterday we listened to him uh, during the inauguration. He is a good orator. And he's a vitreoretinal uh, specialist as well. Uh, so he would, uh, he has two s talks. One is on pathophysiology of vitreoretinal interface in clinical implications. The second, he want to enlighten about uh, ICO and uh, what resources are available for Indian ophthalmologists. It's a very interesting uh, talk it would be. So I request uh, Dr. Widerman to start his first talk. Thank you, Thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, yes, I will first talk on pathophysiology of the vitreoretinal interface and clinical implications. That's what I'm doing for profession as a retinal surgeon in my town in Leipzig in Germany. Germany. I have no disclosures to make. Andreas Brinkmann is the one who works very closely with me. The vitreous is the largest structure in the human eye. A network of collagen fibers maintains the gel state and causes the tensile strength. Hyaluronic acid gives the volume. In old age, the organization expires. The retina and vitre, the, there is liquid bubbles forming in the vitreous. The retina and vitreous body separate slowly. Bags of liquids appear and flow together and at the same time the att attachment is weakening, resulting in collapse. In places where the ILM is particularly thin, the vitreoretinal interface attachment is particularly strong. PVD should be understood as a physiological aging process. Just some facts. A posterior complete vitreous detachment is less common in old age than we previously thought. The progression is chronic rather than acute. And in more than 40%, nearly 50% of the eyes, there is an associated vitreous chysis, a splitting of the posterior vitreous cortex. The ILM is different, has a different thickness in different parts of the eye. It's quite thick at the posterior pole and quite thin at the periphery. And in old age, the thickness is increasing. So the lamella structure of the vitro-retinal interface can be seen clearly in the green picture. And if you dissolve it more clearly with electron microscopy, for example, you see that it's made up by connective tissue, cell adhesion proteins, 
the basal lamina of the Müller cells and the Müller cell end feet. So it's a complex structure. In light microscopy, we only have the green line here. So when we as surgeons pull the retina by, for example, during ILM pe peeling, you see we disrupt the Müller cells, the red stars there. And in the end, something of the Müller cells, here these bubbles or these parts come off with the ILM, at least in some cases. So this is a New Year's picture of my hometown. And you see we even have Müller cells in the sky because uh, the German pathologist Heinrich Müller was born 200 years ago and he was the one who did first described the Müller cells and first described vitreous detachment. The, and this lets me come to the Müller cells. The Müller cells, as you know, are a very spectacular cell extending through all of the retina from the vitreous border to the pericaria of the photoreceptors and they essentially make connections to every cell in the, in the retina. They are very regularly, there's a very regular order and you see if you cut horizontally through the retina, you see how regularly they are distributed. And the inner border of the ILM, you see in green the foot plates of the Müller cells and these are ganglion cells. So most of the border to the vitreous is made up by Müller cells. And you see the Müller cells are the core structure of the vitro-retinal information process and each Müller cell uh, cares for several photoreceptors, one cone and several rods and several neurons. So it, this is the unit in the peripheral retina. In the macular area it's different. The Müller cells, we believe that the Müller cells are used, for example, for light guiding. The light arrives here and then through the trunk of the Müller cell comes down to the photoreceptors, avoiding the, uh, the diffraction of the retinal material here. So each Müller cell has one cone which it cares for. It's a pair. Müller cell and cone. And you see the light coming through these light fibers to the retina. So it's a very spectacular task. Of course, the Müller cell has other tasks for maintenance of tissue homeostasis like potassium and water homeostasis, neurotransmitter uptake, regulation of pH and metabolic support and antioxidative defense. Now, my interest here is especially for the macula, and in our country it's cold, so I enjoy very much to be here in indoor. Um, you see, and it has been known for some time, that a cone-shaped structure is here in front of the, of the photoreceptors, and the, photorecept the fovea is, is special because, of course, there is no uh, connections and no ganglion cells in this area. Everything is moved to the uh, foveal wall. The first famous picture was in 69 by Yamada and you see this structure which is called the Müller cell cone and it has been described several times. But there is not much known. There is very few histology and we had have done now histology on human eyes and macaque eyes and try to further define what, how the structure in this area is. We found that in each fovea there is about 30 to 35 Müller cells in human and macaque eyes. These are the uh, cell bodies of the Müller cells and these are the peripheral extensions. And we then uh, filled with dye uh, single Müller cells and reconstructed them three-dimensionally. 
And you see that in this fovea, the Müller cells have a very, spe very special form. The, the soma of the Müller cells is close to the internal limiting membrane, and this extends to the outer limiting membrane. So, in difference to peripheral retina, in the fovea we have two kinds of Müller cells. The ones who are known and have a set shape and extend in the foveal wall, and these very special ones in the bottom of the fovea. If we look by electron microscopy to these structures, we have five layers, the ILM, the Henle fiber layer, the outer nuclear layer, and the outer fibers of the cone cells and the outer nuclear membrane. And the first thing we observed is that the basal lamina in the human foveola is very, very thin. You see 30 to 40 nanometers compared to about one micrometer in the foveal wall. So very big difference. So what we heard in the beginning, the ILM is very thick in the center, is not true for the fove foveola. Um, the structure then is, okay, these are these Müller cells, the set type Müller cells, and then after the ILM follows a lamella structure, these are thin processes of the Müller cells, and they smooth the inner surface of the foveola, they create additional barriers against the vitreous cavity, and they provide mechanical stability. And we think this is so thin to not uh, change the light refraction and to even the surface of the foveola. The outer processes of these Müller cells have a light and low density optical structure and we think this is good for light transmission and you will see this in different pictures. Another point these Müller cells in the center of the foveola express glutamine synthetase very scarcely. Why? They don't need to care for any neurons. They don't need uh, glutamine synthetase, but they express highly glial fibrillary acidic protein, and this means there must be some stress on these cells. And now we come to the clinical application, because I'm not an anatomist. <laughs> Uh, you know that there is a pre-macular liquefied lacuna early in life without vitreous shrinkage. Later, when we get vitreous detachment, fluid gets into this pocket and the pocket extends. This, I think, is a very nice picture of a very fresh um, posterior vitreous detachment. Then, when this pocket becomes larger, the, the stress uh, vectors became larger, and the retina is pulled. Now, what about our structure? The essential idea, what we have shown here, is that there is no structural relation between these Müller cells and the Müller cell cone. So, when there is uh, pulling of the vitreous on these structures, then a space develops, and you can see this very well in this spontaneous macular hole um, where the Müller cell cone is lifted, and here in the area where we have the uh, less dense uh, extensions of the Müller cells it goes down to the bottom of the retina. So this is comparable to the ideas of Chang and Bayern who observed this by OCT. So our histology supports these OCT findings. And then this was a very, for me, spectacular hole because it developed by itself and it closed after cataract surgery. So you don't need vitro retinal surgery, <laughs> cataract surgery is enough. But you see the photoreceptors, there is still a defect. 
And this is another spontaneous macular hole in a myopic patient. And here, too, you have spontaneous closure, but you have a small defect left after in the photoreceptor layer. So the conclusion of my talk is the healthy vitreous is important for ocular homeostasis by uh, buffering, for example, kalium ions. Posterior vitreous detachment is a normal, early, but chronic aging process. The problems which are caused come by incomplete posterior vitreous detachment. This um, posterior vitreous detachment involves Müller cells because Müller cells make part of the internal limiting border. And the structure of the Müller cells in the foveola, which are very special, explains the pathogenesis of a macular hole. Thank you. I can go on. Second presentation. Second Stop. presentation. Th thank you, Peter, for a wonderful uh, exposition on Muller cells and I'm talking about Muller uh, 20 years back. And I think uh, uh, Peter runs uh, excellent uh, research facilities in Leipzig. You can go with the next uh, talk, Peter. So, the next presentation I give as president of the International Council of Ophthalmology. And I was asked to report on what the ICO can do for Indian ophthalmologists. Uh, of course, no disclosure. The World Health Organization has defined sustainable development goals, and one is good health and well-being for all people in the world. And of course, if we see that amongst the 73 billion people, 250 million are visually impaired, and 75% of these have visual impairment, which is avoidable, then we see that, we, that the ophthalmologists have a great task to do. And this is organized, for example, in the initiative, in the global initiative Vision 2020, which had as a goal to eliminate avo avoidable blindness until 2020. Of course, this has been reduced a little bit to reduce it by 25% through the provision of eye care to all those in need. Well, the basis of all our relations as medical doctors is doctor-patient. And of course, Indians have a very long tradition, I mean, more than 200 years, 2,000 years or more. And you have so many patients that you need your society to have something to put against. But even if the Indian society has more than 20,000 life members, the world is larger, and therefore the national societies have associated to form the International Council of Ophthalmology, and then we have a big coverage of the world, and we have about 220,000 ophthalmologists which are members by their societies of the, of the ICO. So essentially we have 120 national societies, eight regional member societies, and 42 sub-specialty societies. We, are, we have an official relationship with the World Health Organization uh, and are collaborating with the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness and other non-government organizations. And of course, the supranational organizations like APAO are members of the International Council. So it's still growing because there's still some countries who are not members, but most of the countries are members. And what we want, we have more than 200,000 ophthalmologists somehow in this network, but we want your engagement. So it's not only what we can give to Indian ophthalmology, but we want Indian ophthalmology to help <coughs> us to support our goals. So what are the strategic goals of the ICO? It's to empower societies, not so strong societies as you, but of, as you know, there is societies which just are created then enhance education and advance eye health to conserve, improve, and restore human eyesight. 
So for society, we try to support societies, and I shortly mentioned this, for example, by you can work in our committees. We publish a letter which is sent by email to those who want it, ICO Insight, and we have for young ophthalmologists an international leaders initiative and leadership development programs. What is very important that we want to foster education and what is probably best known is the fellowships, the exams and the World Ophthalmology Congress, WOC. And we have another program teaching the teachers and we provide curricula, OSCARs, guidelines and accreditation. In the end, we have many different programs and the future goal for the ICO must be to integrate these different aspects. But I will talk about those things first, which are maybe important for individual ophthalmologists. Teaching the Teachers is an initiative where until now 44 residency program courses have been performed and more than 2,000 program directors and faculty have participated. Though we come into a country and teach the teachers how to teach better. Then we have an electronic center for ophthalmic educators that provides courses for educators, learning tools, and sends out a letter which is interesting even for an individual ophthalmologist because you can see what teaching material is available in the world. It's not only our material, we connect to other sites. We developed specific curricula which can be adapted for local needs. So we cannot make one curriculum for all of the world. It has to be changed in South America compared, let's say, to India maybe. And this includes, and this is all published on our website, cornea, external diseases, glaucoma, retina, pediatric ophthalmology. And there is in development one for education and for oncology. And this is, of course, not a... And we have some development for vitro to surgery and FACO. And these... And then we have developed assessments of how you learn things. And so-called ophthalmology surgical competency assessment rubric. And this is available for different surgeries, cataracts, FACO, small incision surgery, strabism, vitrectomy. And this is an example. You see that the, the pupil and the teacher can check where the person stands. So it should be more objective than until now. When I was learned surgery, I had to sit three years next to the professor, of course, and sit and sit and always ask, may I, may I? And suddenly he was not there, he said, you can do it now. Uh, that's difficult. I know that you, this is when I was trained, it's a long time ago, so today it's better, but still in some countries it is very helpful if both the teacher and the pupil can check where the student stands. Then we have another website available for young ophthalmologists especially, but for teachers too, where we have a collaboration with the Utah University and where they offer their lectures free. So it's quite interesting. I have a daughter who is a resident, so I recommended her to look at this. The ICO develops guidelines and the two which are available at the moment is for diabetic eye care and for glaucoma. And these booklets, again, are important to standardize treatment all over the world. And of course, the newest idea is to accreditate eye care training programs. And the idea is you need accreditation, you need peer review if you want to standardize the quality of a program. I mean, we started in India and India is was very easy because we started with the LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, which is, of course, a luminary institution. Um, but it will be an example for, uh, for other institutions. I am not certified yet, yeah, but it will come. So 
idea of integrating all the education is providing teaching materials, teach the teachers, offer fellowships, exams, and the World Congress. So the fellowships is maybe what is of biggest interest to you. More than 1,100 fellowships have been given to students from eight, or is it, no, ophthalmologists from 84 countries. And we have about 135 hospitals who offer these, offer to be a host in 33 countries. And we have several society sponsored fellowships. The fellowships are organized by these two people, Professor Seitz from Germany and Cordula Gabel Obermeier, who is here, as you can see. <laughs> and it, she is at the booth at, of the ICO booth. And here you see my recent fellows from India, and all of them were a pleasure to have. And, well, the Indian ambassador in Germany did not come to my fellowship hospital. I visited him with my fellow, but still it is, I was very pleased. And I can say I have had, I've done this for many years, and 10 years ago, the fellows came and said, well, you have good equipment. Now they come, oh, you are working with this stuff but they still can learn something. But what, and so now I tell you what fellowships we have. We have one very special one, the Allagan Advanced Research Fellowship. I come back to this. We have the three months fellowships, which are the highest number. We have six month fellowships in retinoblastoma. And we have a one year fellowship of the Retinal Research Foundation and of the Fred Hollows Foundation. And I have put down the application deadlines. And as I can say with John together, my, he will speak after me, that the NIH and the ICO have just agreed, agreed to have a one-year fellowship at the NIH in ocular genetics, which is a very, very special thing. And very much thank you to you. This is really new. This is the first time this is announced and that he is the one who did it. So who is eligible for these fellowships? The last one I don't know exactly yet. You can tell later who is eligible. But normally under 40 years, specialist in ophthalmology, high motivation, uh, it should be relevant to the home country. You should have the ICO exams. You see what we offer on subspecialties. Most people choose surgical retina, pediatric, cornea, glaucoma, cataract. So what is interesting about India, most of our fellows came from India, 230, but even more astonishing, India has had 145 fellows from other countries. So India is a country, and this is due to your society, I think, too, who has made the transition from sending fellows. It's always good to send fellows to other countries, but they do take up fellows from other countries. Thank you very much. Uh, the special fellowship I mentioned is the Allegan Research Fellowship. This is open to people from all countries, and you have to uh, continue research which you already started. It's $50,000 per year, and uh, you can, could apply next year. So it's a very special fellowship. And this was my first email this year from a fellow from Nigeria who wrote me that he had spent three months in India and had learned a lot. And I was very pleased to have this email, and so I show it here. Uh, ICO examinations. The idea is by Peter Watson, who founded these examinations, that, and by Fritz Naumann, former ICO president, that if you learn something, you should be able to show that you have learned it, and this needs an exam. So without exam, there may be not enough learning. Exams, 
are represented here by Claire Davy and Nicola. Nicola didn't get her e-visa approved, so she had to return to London, so it's only Claire who is here, and she is the chief, the chair of the ICO exams. We have several exams. First is the standard examination, visual sciences, optic, optics, and clinical ophthalmology, which is offered uh, now in April. And when you are an applicant from a member society, as India is, of course, then you get, in addition, the foundation assessment. So I heard you can hit two mangoes with one stone if you do these exams. Yeah? The more, if you have passed these exams, you can do the advanced ICO exam, which will give you the t acronym Fellow of the International Council of Ophthalmology. I'm very proud to be Fellow of the uh, All India Society now. Thank you very much to its. Uh, but f Fellow of ICO is, um, my, I don't know whether it's more difficult than Fellow of the Indian Society Honorary Fellow is easy because, uh, but to do it through the examination is not easy. If you pass this examination, you really know something in ophthalmology. I'm always very impressed by the knowledge of the fellows who have passed this advanced ICO examination. And now uh, I have heard that the subspecialty examinations which are developed by the ICO are accepted by the Indian society as the written part of their subspecialty uh, examination. So this is, this shows you that the value and the standard of the ICO examinations is very high and that they are setting a standard worldwide because if you pass this, you really know something. And the ICO exams have a reciprocity program with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow and now with Edinburgh. And so they too accept the written ICO examinations and uh, will follow on with a, to become a fellow of these uh, colleges. Well, the other thing we want to do is advance eye health by international guidelines, ethical code for ophthalmologists, and position papers. All of this is always to be adapted for your country, or India is so big, your continent nearly. But uh, on the other hand, it's good if you have something which is internationally accepted, and it, it's a lot of work to make things internationally accepted. So we have ban on consumer fireworks, surgical safety, corneal tissue transplant, uh, op to obtain corneal tissue transplant, continuous professional development, which is important too. I mean, you have to have a balance in your life as a surgeon and as a doctor accreditation and teams training. Uh, for example, team training means that we believe it's not the single doctor who can provide eye care, especially in difficult areas. It's the eye care team as you in India show us. I mean, you have set the examples for this. And I think team means together everybody achieves more. We have provided a global statement on diabetes, and when I hear that 73 million people in India have diabetes, it's an important statement. And as I said, we have an official relationship to, world, to the World Health Organization, and this is important because the global action plan of the World Health Organization uh, relates to every country who is member of the World Health Organization. I, and I am coming from an old country in the sense of, uh, of these 200 years, not of 2,000 years looking back, let's say. So in our medicine, everybody thinks everything is well regulated by us, but it's not true. And secondly, decisions of the World Health Organization, of course, relate to us in the same way as to you. The, the governments have to transfer these decisions to their countries. 
One important thing, for example, is the future disease classification, ICD-11, which is developed by the World Health Organization with the support of the ICO and the essential medicines list, so the medicines which should be available in every country. Um, yeah, and we support, of course, um, diabetes, glaucoma, eye care, and we provide numbers on, on the number of ophthalmologists worldwide. If I had have been at such a meeting at the World Health Organization, and there the question is who is providing really eye care? And it's not so clear because we have the optometrists, and not everything is done by ophthalmologists, so we have to take care of the ophthalmologists too. Finally, the first part of the integration, at least, of our education uh, commitments is the World Health and the, the World Ophthalmology Congress in Cape Town next year, and I heartily invite you to be there. Um, this is the principal global congress focused on education. I think it's very good <laughs> education. It's the oldest international medical congress. Only the German meeting is two months earlier because Albrecht von Graefe was the one who founded both of them. And it's a unique opportunity for networking and exchange. It's the first time in Africa and the revenues will support our World Alliance for Sight. We have co-hosts in the South African Society and the Middle East African Society Council of Ophthalmology and the African Ophthalmology Council. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi has said, the change that you wish to see in the world has to be you yourself. So I would ask you to come and show. For me, I am always impressed that how <coughs> India is showing to the world that modern medicine, most modern medicine, is affordable. So show us the Indian way and come at least a thousand delegates and come to the WOC. Thank you very much. Yesterday I did, did my bit and I requested all the members to attend in large numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for a wonderful uh, talk on as an ICU as well as the, on the, uh, the interface and vitreoidal interface and Muller cells. And I think really nice. To Thank you for coming, and sorry for the less audience, but I think we have learned a lot, and I think we will convey that to our people. Next uh, presidential guest is uh, my, my brother, that is uh, Gyan Prakash from uh, National Institute of Health, and uh, he is uh, well known uh, in Indian ophthalmology because he has done a lot of contribution for the Indi research in India, and, uh, and he is collaborating as a collaborator from the federal government with the government of India. And we have Professor Balu here, who is interacting on behalf of the Government of India and uh, our uh, Indian ophthalmology. So uh, let us have Jan Prakash to, to give his talk. And I, I think uh, because of uh, Jan Prakash, a lot of research topics have been included in, the, in this meeting. I know our meeting is, we have A to Z in ophthalmology, both the technology, scientific, surgery, but we have got a lot of, if you have seen a lot of people, speakers are from uh, uh, research side and John represents the uh, research aspect uh, for Indian ophthalmology. Okay, uh, good morning. Prash, I have always been wanting to say, uh, President Natarajan, uh, Dr. Ajit Babu, uh, Dr. Namrata Ji, distinguished guests, um, and the audience. This is a great honor to be here, and especially uh, on the invitation of the, uh, the president of the association. This is a great place to really interact and do uh, science. And I've always said we are going, we, are, we have now come to the bullseye, the center of India, to really develop uh, the Indo-US relationship. So what I'm going to talk about is the international research collaboration, essentially the way we, we view it is really the next frontier for uh, uh, working on and also uh, um, 
not only developing research programs, but that's the way that's the wave of the future to really um, stop the avoidable blindness and work towards many other eye diseases. So I'm going to quickly, this is a disclaimer. Um, how many of you know NIH, heard of NIH? Just show of hand. Okay, so few. Um, so National Institute of Health, where I come from, is an, is an agency of uh, Department of Health and Human Services, which is like your uh, Ministry of Health here in, uh, in India. And, um, but the motto of uh, National Institutes of Health, as you can see here, is an agency of the United States government that conducts and supports biomedical research to uncover new knowledge that improves the health of all Americans and so this and the human condition throughout the world. So essentially, it's not just working on American disease or anything related to America. We are very interested in uh, helping working and uh, on, on the programs, biomedical programs that improves the human condition throughout the world. National Eye Institute is one of the 27 NIH institutes and centers that's dedicated to just for eye research. And uh, you can learn more about it uh, on our website. Uh, we, just to give you a uh, breadth of our program, we have close to $800 million budget per year that uh, translates into just doing eye research, all supporting 50, uh, uh, close to 2,000 projects all over the world. Uh, mainly American, but you can see that six, about 85% of that $800 million that makes approximately $650 million just goes to support uh, programs all over the world, uh, not just NEI. We do have our own laboratories, our own, own scientists who are working with us, and uh, uh, they obviously are also doing cutting-edge scientific research. In just last four years, you can see that our programs have expanded from having about 32 programs in about 30, 13 countries. Now we are doing about close to 180 programs in about 30 countries. So in just four years, the wave of internationalization has really taken, uh, taken over. I cannot claim that this is just, it's all because of me, but essentially it's because of you, people like you, our collaborators, partners all around the world. And let me describe a few programs to you. So this is our uh, footprint just a few years ago. Now this, is, this was in 200, 2016, this was in 2017, and now you can see that this is our view of 2018. This is the footprint where we have programs we are working with people in about 30 countries. Now, what is our view for, of international research? We truly believe that global science is interconnected, uh, we seek opportunities to identify what shared priorities are. We are supporting international opportunities as much as possible, supporting U.S. grantees to expand their international collaborations, and we are for forming partnership among scientists, governments, companies, NGOs. We had a very uh, effective session yesterday, standing room only, working how we work with the NGO and Dr. Natarajan. Uh, work with us on that, so there was just a, a lot of interest yesterday. And we leverage our partnership and fund programs that answer important questions um, it, of understanding eye diseases. We not only provide programs and supports and do collaborations, we also train scientists at National Eye Institute. And uh, training as you can see here, is, is a big part of uh, um, our uh, program in our intramural laboratories. And right next to in USA, we have India. Sta really, that stands out, has the second highest number of pro I mean, young scientists that are being trained. You can see here that uh, we are not only training them, we are sending them back home. So they're not staying in the US. We, we just in the last 10 years, we have sent close to 34 scientists who have uh, uh, lineage and, and training and collaboration at, at National Eye Institute. In terms of looking at the previous stalwarts, 
and people who have actually been trained and worked with us or have been visiting scientists who have come back to India. It's, a, it's an honor to have Dr. Bala Subramaniam sitting with us here. He used to be with us just a few years ago. Now he's leading and he has led the direction of eye research in, in India. Here's the picture of uh, Dr. Paul Seving, who is the current director of National Eye Institute. And as you can see from this quote that he's literally thinking and quoting and saying that you know, a lot of unanswered questions will come from working with the scientists in places like India. Because clearly these, these things, exposure to unusual task, toxins, unique populations, and uh, genetic eye diseases, and new priorities, new methods delivery will all, or uh, mostly we believe, will come from working with people from around the world. Uh, this, you know, I wanted to put this slide in here, and this clearly shows that, it, you know, over the years, just in past 20, 25, 30 years, there's been a decrease in percentage of exclusively domestic papers, and there's a substantial increase in the total annual output that includes any kind of international collaboration. And in terms of scientific uh, validity, scientific proof, you can see that you know, citation impact is typically greater when research groups collaborate, work with each other, and the benefits really strengthens when the co-authorship is international. So this is literally leading us, taking us to a call for greater and more and more internalization of our uh, scientific research. I wanted to actually mention to you a, a, a program that uh, was uh, founded about uh, over 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and uh, Dr. Bala Subramanian has, uh, was uh, co-founder of this program working with us. And this program has yielded several projects where Indian scientists, Indian organizations have worked with uh, uh, very, um, very, very um, research-oriented universities in America. Shankar Netrala has worked with the Harvard. L.B. Prasad has worked with uh, Washington University. Arvind has worked with Cleveland Clinic. Um, again, so uh, as you can see that NIN Hyderabad has worked with the University of California. Shroff Hospital has uh, been working with uh, MIT on a, uh, a famous program called Project Prakash. And uh, this program went into a second round. We did some overhauls, some cleaning, some uh, uh, lessons that we had learned from our first program. So uh, we added uh, some new concept, new ideas, and that resulted into two uh, very good-sized programs that are currently running in, uh, in India with the U.S. collaboration. And in this, we have a Shankar Naitrala working with, a, with a folks in, uh, at Harvard in glaucoma, and then in the field of diabetic retinopathy, this program was just funded last year. Cleveland Clinic is working with, again, uh, folks in uh, Chennai. At this point, we have the third round of uh, uh, program, which uh, we just overhauled and uh, put in, uh, ex expanded the program from three areas of research to almost all areas of eye disease. And this program is currently on. It's a three-year program, and all of you are eligible to apply as long as you work with an uh, American partner. American partner gets paid and gets funded by the National Eye Institute, and your funding comes from the Department of Biotechnology. So here's some, uh, some website that, that you can go on and uh, get more details. Um, in addition to, so it's a multi-pronged approach in terms of international research. In addition to the Indo-US program, we also have a, a month-long genomics fellowship, and uh, that we started about uh, three years ago. We've been training one scientist in uh, genomic research every year. In honor of all of you here, in honor of the 200, 200 years of uh, Indian ophthalmology, and in honor of all the collaboration, and also, I'm going to talk about some things, the Global Eye Genetics Consortium. We've just expanded this program. Now this program will invite five scientists from uh, international countries to work with us for a month. This is a completely, fully paid program by National Eye Institute. Comes out of my budget. And uh, these five, five scientists will stay 
at NIH, residential, everything is paid for, including travels, stay, and all that, and will get exclusive training in genomic research. In addition, as uh, Dr. Uh, Peter uh, just announced, we have just concluded a, a deal with ICO, and we're very, very pleased, and I'm honored that Peter is here sitting with me at the podium. We are really honored to actually uh, announce here that we have put in a brand new ICO fellowship, and it's going to be year-long, um, and uh, um, this will be exclusively in ophthalmic genetics uh, field, and this program is, is on now. We will be recruiting, and we will be having the fellow work with us for a year next year. So thank you, ICO, for the collaboration, and uh, this is all falling in, in place. It's a very multi-pronged approach, working on funds, working on uh, various uh, uh, fellowships, uh, multiple fellowship, m multiple postdoctoral programs that are very American-based programs. So as you can see, we are addressing the um, programs from all angles. Okay, so Global Eye Genetics Consortium is a new program we just started, and this um, really takes the, you know, very exclusive 30 countries are participating right now. We have members approximately 200 uh, working with us. India has played a very, very key role in this. Um, it's an honor to have Professor Takeshi Iwata from uh, Japan sitting with us in the audience. He is the current president, and Professor S. Natarajan is the secretary general. And so India has, a, has been playing a very uh, important role in the program. And uh, um, this is, you know, a lot of work at Global Eye Genetic Consortium has uh, been focused on international research collaboration. There are two publications that had, have just come out in the last two years, Advances in Vision Research, Volume 1, and we just published the second volume just a few months ago. We are currently in the process of publishing the third volume, which we hope that will be published uh, in a few months. And we, are, we have volume four on the drawing board for next year. So uh, people in uh, uh, Global Eye Genetics Consortium have been very active, and India is playing very important role. So th there will be two exclusive sessions, one on the Indo-US program this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Dr. Balu will be co-chairing it with me, so please come to that for for, for a detailed discussion on that. And then tomorrow morning, Dr. Takeshi Iwata and I will be chairing a program on GEGC, and we'll, we'll talk about the details of that. So with that, I would like to conclude, and with a slogan that, uh, you know, I came up with, and my boss gave me a patent on that. So I always say that good eye, good eye research anywhere is good eye research everywhere. Whatever you develop here in uh, Indore, it can be used in Indiana. And whatever you uh, come out with, it, with it, whether in terms of collaboration or training, we welcome that. We are all together in this. If you have a cure, if you have found a diagnostics, there's no reason why we cannot use it and vice versa. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And Dr. Natarajan, we have done it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot for uh, inspiring us as well as supporting the Indian research in ophthalmology, plus uh, also coming all the way and spending several days uh, with uh, only working on Indian ophthalmology and supporting the All India Ophthalmic Sys uh, Society. And it's a he, great, he great is, yeah. yeah. He sent a very positive note that Indians can apply and get it. And he op he's opened the doors very well and uh, we should uh, really enter as a guest and uh, take the opportunity. Um, they know first. 200 years of AIO. Yes. They know first. Yes. I will. Thank you. Thank you, John. And we have uh, our very old friend who has visited, I think, All India Ophthalmic Society out of 77 uh, conferences, maybe 35. 35. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jerry, for the support. And Jerry is also involved in uh, ocular genetics. And thanks for being here. Well, thank you, Dr. Natarajan, for honoring me by having me come to this uh, wonderful symposium. Dr. Maji, Dr. Sajdev, Dr. Sharma, and the delegates, thank you for 
listening to my talk. I think you'll find it very interesting because this is my perception of the evolution of ophthalmology here in India, my perceptions over the past 33 years. So come with me on the journey. I'll discuss with you where we were, where we are now, and where we're going. So where we were. This, of course, is a very auspicious meeting because it's the 200th anniversary of the first ophthalmic hospital, not only in South Asia, but all of Asia. So it's not only in India, but also all of Asia. The first one, of course, was established in London in 1885 and is known now as Moorfields. Now, why was an eye hospital developed here in India? It had to do with the East India Company. Dr. Benjamin Travis, who was the surgeon here for the East India Company, saw that there were a lot of injuries with the British soldiers and a lot of diseases referable to the eye. So he felt it was very important that we have an eye hospital here. And uh, they had established one in Moorfields in 1805, and so he, uh, his disciple, uh, he contacted Dr. Travers, um, who, and uh, Dr. Richardson came here and established what was then the Madras Eye Infirmary in July of 1819, 200 years ago. So this was first called the Edgemore Eye Hospital. It's a government hospital. You could, there's one error in the sign outside of the hospital, which was brought to my attention because uh, the uh, first hospital in London was established not in 1818, but as I said, in 1805. But we could excuse them for that error. The hospital in Madras, in China, owes its glory really to Lieutenant Colonel R.H. Elliott, who was the superintendent in 1905 and 1904, and we know him because of the scleroconeal tree finding that's still considered as innovative, a very practical procedure for the treatment of glaucoma, and was developed at the Edgemore Eye Hospital. The first Indian to occupy the office of superintendent was Dr. Nair, and he oversaw the institution of your postgraduate diploma course in ophthalmology. The first one after independence was Dr. Muthraya, who established the Eye Bank and performed the first cornea transplant in India. But Indian ophthalmology did not start in 1819. It goes way back to the fifth century BC. Sushrutta performed the first cataract surgery, either couching or extracapsular. He was the first world's first eye surgeon as we know it. 500 BC, he actually wrote a book <coughs> called Sushrutta Samhitra, and he explained his surgical procedures. Now there may be an error in this designation because it says it was 2000 BCE, but it was really uh, the sixth century before. And there they do couching. And see me, here's some of the instruments. They also did expulsion of the lens material, not only couching. So here's some of the earliest texts of Indian ophthalmology, Samshusra, Samhitra. Beforehand, they treated eye diseases with herbal or plant-based pharmacopoeia. And here's a statue, well-deserved in Hadawa of Sushutra, and some of his writings. And there were about 120 chapters, books, not only in ophthalmology, but in other fields. And this is uh, one of the manuscripts written on wood. Some of it was translated into English. And here's some references to Sashutra's works. So this goes back, Indian ophthalmology was probably one of the first in the world, before the Arabs, before Europe. 
And as I said, it goes back 1,000 to 3,000 years be uh, before Seshutra, and that was when couching was popular, and it was done even before it was done in Europe. Now let's get to the All India Ophthalmological Society. The first meeting was in 1930 in Mumbai. Now I did not attend that meeting, although Dr. Narajan thinks I'm old enough that perhaps I could have. <laughs> but I did attend the Golden Jubilee meeting in Delhi in 1992. And I did attend the Platinum Jubilee in Jaipur in 2017, plus meetings every other year, too. But my introduction to India was back in 1991, when we had the AIOS meeting in Udaipur. You can see my form of transportation there. We uh, had it at the medical school there. It was outside. We sat on concrete blocks in an amphitheater and our meals were prepared and pits dug into the ground. This is the book from that meeting, and it's quite significant. Amazing. Because, look, the only reference to intraocular lenses was from Rayner and Keeler. The only ad, the only reference at all to intraocular lenses, because the work there was still intracapsular, capsule and all to remove the lens. And one of the reasons I came was to work with the Indians to popularize the use of uh, intraocular lenses and also to train them in extracapsular surgery. We went to eye camps sponsored by uh, the Rotary. And here's, this was with the KEM hospital in Bombay. Uh, Dr. Natarajan was not there at the time, but this is Dr. Moscati and uh, Dr. Pai, who was in charge of public health at the um, university and put himself in charge of the food that I could eat and not eat. I lost weight on that trip because of him. Uh, our patients, they segregated the women from the men. They were not together. And here's the post-ops, uh, very comfortable. The examinations we uh, did with the torch and blocked them on the outside. You can see in those days I was much thinner and I had hair, black hair. Our set KEM hospital brought all the instruments, sterilized them. They had a very good policy and procedures and it worked very efficiently. And the magic water went over our hands, no gloves, our operating theaters and that's Dr. Moscati, who had been president of this society, uh, and then Koresh Moscati followed uh, a couple of decades later. We did intracapsular. I don't know if uh, the residents had seen intracapsular, but this was one way. We brought our own generator, so we were able to use uh, freezing probes to remove it intact. And our post-op's very happy, and naturally we did not use lens implants, so these were the AFACA classes naturally was a cause of celebration. This is a significant uh, picture. This is Sajana Moscati when she was engaged to Koresh. The photographer was Koresh Moscati, and of course his father. The next year we uh, came back because we wanted to do further teaching at a major conference on lens implants, and I was asked to participate to teach and to interest Indian ophthalmologists in the use of lens implants. And with us uh, were uh, Jan Wost and uh, Fyodorov. So where are we on now? Look at that, femtosecond laser compared to the way we did it in the past. Indian ophthalmology and the uh, state of the art has um, gone all over India, at least South India. And this is Aravind, how happy they are with the spread of major institutes throughout Southern uh, India. And, uh, of course, they're proud of the number of cases that they do. Uh, it is efficient, like uh, I was at JJ Hospital a couple of days ago in Mumbai, and they had the swinging microscope, and the patients are uh, side by side. Uh, patients are transported back and forth to the villages. They have, uh, now you have screening uh, in remote areas. Uh, 
by satellite, and this is the way it is today. And not only that, but they teach foreign doctors uh, and uh, for administration and training in ophthalmology. A lot of charitable work is being done. This is our entire Desiree Eye Hospital in Gurgaon, uh, uh, Arun Sethi, Rina Sethi. And we come out and we work with them. That's my son. He was out here a few uh, years ago to work with them. Even uh, Mitt Romney was here working with them because it's a Mormon type of um, a facility. And here we are doing demonstration surgery, uh, school screenings now being done in India, early capture of um, eye disease and the wet labs that are fantastic to pick up all these diseases. And again, my son working in the screenings uh, in remote areas. <coughs> he's not an ophthalmologist, he's a lawyer. School screenings. And last year, two members of my staff came out to work with them, Arlene and Elizabeth. And they saw the way the uh, population that they deal with live. These are uh, little huts that uh, the uh, workers rent when they come to Delhi, to Gurgaon, for work. And she met the children of these workers. But believe it or not, inside there was a television. And the screening procedures with my staff. Naturally, they had the tour of India. So where are we going? Well, Dr. Prakash talked about the research being done here in India. This is the future. Genetic, stem cell, pluripotent induced embryonic stem cell tissue regeneration. All that work is being done in the institutes here that Dr. Prakash mentioned. Verenda Sangwan is uh, very prominent in stem cell. And these are the reasons for it. These are the strategies that are being used. And we had held in the past a genetics course here at the meeting. And this is my crew. Keratoprosthesis prosthesis is also being done here. Koresh Moskati with the Pintucci integrated and the Boston keratoprosthesis. prosthesis. Tony Altavi came out here and was working with the Indians and the uh, prosthesis is now being made at Aravand uh, in Madurai. So you can see the advances from the distant past 10 centuries ago to the present. We're off to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry? Uh, really eye-opener. Uh, as Indian ophthalmologists, we are revisited into our past. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. And Schultz. I think, uh, thanks for now, your dedication. And I think uh, you inspired many Indians to do, I think, as an, uh, I know you're a, you're a global citizen, but uh, as an, <laughs> sure. And I'm really impressed because I wanted to tell you that I attended your first international intraocular implant uh, meeting in uh, Taj uh, in uh, Mumbai in 1983, you came with Fidro and you were giving me lenses and I took back and gave it to my teacher. And I take this opportunity to invite uh, my mentor in International Council of Ophthalmology, that is uh, Bruce Pivey, and, and I think uh, everybody knows him all over the world. And Bruce, all, and thank you very much for taking your time. And I know you, you are missing your friend Dr. Nakpal here, but still, I think, uh, I hope we will show the recording to him. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning. I promise that I'll quit at 10.30, even if it's in mid-sentence. So let me begin with the, the fact of no financial arrangements. What I'd like to quickly do is recognize ophthalmology as the most beautiful and desirable of all medical specialties. We're all aware of that. Sometimes our colleagues are not but uh, I congratulate all of you for going into ophthalmology. We have historically led in science and education. We have a very strong international community, as this grand meeting indicates. 
but there's still lots of challenges over the world. And just I want to bring you uh, maybe a little bit of Eurocentric uh, evolution of ophthalmology uh, and international ophthalmology and a brief re, uh, review of the challenge which Peter has mentioned and I will probably not and certainly not outline ICO programs and status which he has done very well. You know, I should, put, uh, should for this m meeting have put Indian medicine at the top. The Chinese think they're at the top, the Indians are certain they're at the top, and when in India, follow what India thinks. I think you're historically a leader in ophthalmic writing and care. I could have picked the 50, 300 is an arbitrary number of years. There's nothing that happened immediately that I'm aware of 300 years ago that makes a difference, but there was in the 1500s couching in Japan as well as around the world. And in 1774, uh, Daviel really is credited with the modern cataract treatment, followed fairly rapidly or concurrently with an intracapsular capsular cataract extraction by Richter in Germany. Benjamin Franklin in America invented bifocals. Madriasis came in in 1800, and Thomas Young wrote about accommodation, color, vision, and astigmatism. Now, just a bit about the medical politics. Uh, and now I'm speaking primarily of what is written and what is talked about in American ophthalmology at this time. There were nasty, nasty competitions. Medicine was not highly regarded until the 20th century. And there were horrible battles in print, much anti and pro-advertising. Many surgeons did some eye surgery and the training was poor and non-existent. Uh, however, there were other things happening in the first part of the 1800s, von Grafe, then stri uh, strabismus, enucleation, and the big thing at that time, anesthesia by Long and Morton. The first half of the 1800s uh, had the evolution of Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz, a name revered in ophthalmology, but at that time he was talking about color vision, along with sight, hearing, energy, music, ice, and glaciers. He was quite a brain. As you've already heard, the first eye hospital in, was in Vienna in 1786. Uh, the independent department in 1805 in Vienna and first public eye hospital, Moorfields. The dates are arguable in all cases, but Moorfields gets that credit. And the University of Vienna gets the credit for the first professor of ophthalmology, George Beer. Now the second half of the 1800s was a better, better time. It was in a sense, uh, science, I won't say, I'm probably stretching it to say golden age, but it was a scientific breakthroughs. Still, preceptor ships were held tightly, poor general training, much uh, advertising and self-aggrandizement, and very, very much mean-spirited rhetoric and writing about other practitioners, including ophthalmologists. But there were a few great who, greats who made, in this case, Helmholtz made the, the specialty of ophthalmology by inventing the ophthalmoscope. Only then practitioners who could use the ophthalmoscope, really advanced themselves and became known as ophthalmologists. Prior to that, they were practicing everything else as well, people who treated the eye. Atropine, oh, uh, pardon me, let me go back here. <coughs> oh, let me go forward, enough. We have uh, 
in the 1800s, uh, neonatorum, ophthalmia neonatorum treatment, topical anesthesia, which was a major, major change, and the concept of transplantation. The second half of the 1800s indicated the socialization of ophthalmologists. Uh, the German Ophthalmological Society has the record being established in 1857. The American Ophthalmological Society, 64, and then you see those going on uh, after that, American Academy of Ophthalmology and Otolaryngology in 1896, in Japanese thereafter. The International Council began through the International Congress of Ophthalmology, which is the oldest continuously active medical meeting in the world. And you know our next one is in Cape Town in 2020. In 1927, the International Council was established in order to bring, after World War I, some order and administration to the Congresses. In the first half of the 1900s, Gonan described retinal detachment surgery. The American Board of Ophthalmology was established, as was the International Council of Ophthalmology. Scientific ophthalmology began in the second half of the 1900s with the NIH, and you've heard about that just prior. The subspecialty societies began to develop. Example, the Retina Society in the U.S. in 19. 67. Supranational organizations evolved. We'll hear more, more about that. And instrumentation, sutures, everything got better. At the same time, supranational organizations begin to evolve. And the first one was the Pan American Association of Ophthalmology, then the European Society, Asia Pacific, Middle East Africa, and most recently, the African Ophthalmology Council. Sub-Saharan Africa. 48, the WHO, IAPB in 75, Academia Ophthalmological the same year, and a number of non-governmental organizations. Helen Keller uh, was established in, 18, uh, in 19, 19 and is uh, 100 years old as well. CBM, IEF, Sight Savers, Fred Hollows, all names that you're familiar with and many of you may have worked with them. The international subspecialty organizations uh, have over 40 members in the ICO. Now, the international uh, the, if education effects are not localized to international organizations. This, this society is having a major impact and all in, uh, in ophthalmic education, not only here, but this arena and now around the world. I'd just like to mention something very special that happened to me, and that was in the early 18, uh, 1980s, Pran Nagpal and I became friendly. And he would come to the American Academy of Ophthalmology each year, and I was the, the CEO. And Pran said, you know, we need some help. Indian ophthalmologists can't afford to come to this meeting. If you could give them a complimentary registration, I would see that leading ophthalmologists would come every year, and we would take that information gained back to our society and begin to continuously improve it. I did, he did, and the effects are here today. Peter has mentioned this already, and I won't stay looking at that, but uh, actually the latest guess is that there are 233,000 ophthalmologists worldwide, and you've seen the membership of the ICO uh, right now. Uh, there's a whole litany of discussions about low resource and high resource worlds. They're very different. But let me just describe in closing the experience I had with several others when we went to Nigeria in 2004. Nigeria, the largest uh, population of sub-Saharan Africans as well as the largest number of ophthalmologists. But what we found 
in their training was no curricula, no evaluations, no subspecialties, inadequate teachers, and very poor leadership skills. So we set about responding to those needs, and at that point in today, we have, as Peter said earlier, we have a resident curriculum with 16 segments and seven fellowship curricula for curricula, for evaluations, many, many opportunities worldwide. We have established the curricula for subspecialties and uh, with fellowships, we've made a major impact in improving uh, subspecialization in Sub-Saharan Africa as well as worldwide. The teachers, you've heard about teaching the teachers from Peter, and we have a leadership program underway. I won't, in the sense of time and 30 seconds left, let me just finish with the last new program, which is the Maghrabi ICO Cameroon Eye Institute. It is in Yaoundé, Cameroon. It's a major physical and clinical entity that is francophone primarily, taking care of Central Africa, and will in the years ahead be a leading educational and care program in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you for your attention, and we have completed ourselves on time. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Bruce, for a wonderful talk. And I think uh, you and all of us, I think, we made a lot of searches regarding the contribution by India from along and plus telling us about ICO. And I also want to uh, mention the presence of Dr. Neeru Gupta here. She is the Vice President as well as the CEO of the International Council of Ophthalmology. And, and uh, I think uh, it was wonderful to have all of you and uh, really uh, uh, wonderful to have the international luminaries and coming and supporting us and also we are having a hand holding for us to be in the both uh, ophthalmic surgery and uh, research. And I know a lot of Indian surgeons are excellent, but I think uh, there is always to learn and to give. And I think we have to do that uh, uh, all the time so that we can be in the power of uh, the rest of the world. And I, yeah. We were uh, given the session uh, 15 minutes later than the scheduled, but Bruce, you proved what is the importance of time. If you respect time, time will respect you. Thank you. Thank you. And I bow in front of all the luminaries on the dais. Okay. And we follow you. So that one day, I hope you follow us up. Follow you. Samir, just we have a quick photo so that the next session will start.